Our guest on This is America is Dr. Marina Ottaway. She's senior associate and former director of the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Ottaway is an expert on the Middle East and the Gulf and has taught at universities in Ethiopia, Zambia, Egypt, and South Africa. Doctor, it's good to sit and talk with you once again. Thank you very much. My pleasure. In a very broad stroke of the brush, what's happening in the Arab world? Everything is, is in movement at the same time, is in motion at the same time. I think it has become utterly unpredictable in most countries. Egypt is entering the most difficult part of the transition. Uh, Mubarak was uh, deposed by the military fairly painlessly. Now the military has to deal with the problem of where real power is going to be in the future. Mm -hmm. And the military would like it to be with it. There are plenty of civilian parties that would like to make sure that that does not happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Tunisia and Morocco are doing well. They have had elections in both cases, an Islamist party has gotten the plurality of the voters. So we'll have two uh, Islamist prime ministers, both in Tunisia and in Morocco. But I think these are very moderate organizations. I don't think it's going to be a major crisis. Uh, they have to form coalition governments, so there will have to be a lot of compromise all along. But elsewhere, the situation is utterly unpredictable. Libya. They are barely starting a process of reconstruction. The country is still very much in the hands of militias. It could not be any different at this point. It's not a reason to despair for the future, but that's uh, the situation right now. Syria is, uh, uh, you know, is essentially in a state of civil war. Uh, the government uh, does not want to surrender, but it's quite clear that the protest, it's not going to end either. Mm -hmm. Yemen is the same situation, the president uh, has supposedly stepped down. He's still playing games. Uh, he's not stepped down completely until uh, uh, February when elections are held, but he's not behaving as somebody who is really giving up uh, the idea of being a major political player in his country. So I'm not quite sure how that is going to how that is going to evolve. So there are a lot of question marks all around uh, all around the region. One of the reasons we wanted to invite you back was I think we talked on this program at this table uh, seven or eight months ago, and everybody was so excited about what was happening in Egypt at the time, and uh, you said, uh, it's not a revolution. It's, not a, it's, it's just a beginning. You take out the top guy and you still are left with everybody else who surrounded the top guy. So you were very cautious at that time, and you called it absolutely correctly. Well, what we are, thank you, what we are seeing now, essentially, is the next step, because the military was satisfied with having removed the top guy. Mm -hmm. He thought it could keep, keep everything else pretty intact, uh, you know, that its own power would not be this uh, really shaken that it would be still people close to the older regimes that formed mm. the civilian government. You see the last uh, prime minister that the military, uh, the, the military appointed was uh, Ganzuli, who was a um, uh, uh, prime minister under Mubarak uh, in the past. But you also have now very clearly civilians who have understood what the military is trying to do, and they want to make sure that the military does not succeed. These elections that are happening over the next number of days and weeks in Egypt, how important are those elections? Well, they are important to move the process forward. Mm -hmm. In other words, there have to be you have to go back to a government of institutions so that you have to have an elected parliament, you have to have elected the president, you have to have a new constitution. The problem is that the military right now is, try, is trying to gut all these institutions of any real meaning mm -hmm. because the, the parliament is not going to do much legislating because this is still an interim pro, uh, uh, period and there is not going to be major decisions taken. Mm -hmm. And the military is trying to take it away from it as much as possible, the function of writing a constitution. 
mm. which was the main uh, uh, the main uh, the job of this parliament. The parliament parliament was supposed to set up a hundred men, uh, hundred person, I should say, commission to write uh, the constitution. Uh, the military has come out with a proposal, which is not clear whether it's still in force or not. It's very murky. But the proposal was that the parliament only uh, chooses 20 members of that commission, mm -hmm. and that all the others come from organizations that the military had designated. Wow. So many judges, so many uh, university professors, so many labor unionists, and so on. So essentially, the power of the uh, the parliament had already been reduced very much. Let me ask you this question, because this is what bothers me. When you look at Yemen, and the president has stepped down, okay, and then you look very clearly, and the, the, the most dramatic example would be uh, Egypt and Mubarak, mm -hmm. and Libya and Gaddafi. Why don't the generals in uh, the military in Egypt and Assad over in Syria why don't they get it that unless they make these reforms, as they have done in Morocco, uh, that they're going to end up the same way Gaddafi ended up? The people will turn on them. Why don't they get it? I don't understand. <laughs> I don't a, understand. No, that's a very good question, and I cannot answer it. What? It, why don't they get it? I mean, you you know, you get into psychology. But, 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 but doctor, <laughs> let me just say, put it again on the table. Gaddafi was ripped apart physically. Yeah. Why doesn't Assad see that sooner or later these people will triumph? Why don't the, he just? Start some reforms. Get something moving in the right direction, as the king has done in Morocco. Yes. I think it's not... I think he cannot conceive of a different political system. It, he has never known anything else. Uh, there, some argue that uh, there are other members of the family that are keeping him up from introducing changes, but then you can ask, why don't they see this, the same thing? But that I happens think, also in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. The king is out front of the ministers. Yeah. He keeps yeah. trying to make reforms. And the people around him, underneath him, they don't want the reforms well, to come. Well, you know, you can ask the same question of every dictator that has gone down and yes, uh, yes, flames, yes, essentially. Yes, yes, yes. Why didn't they see it coming? And I think people are deluded themselves. They per perhaps the information that gets to them is filtered, although I think uh, this is less and less true because I would assume that they turn on the television and look at the uh, television for themselves occasionally and so on. I think it's uh, just a mentality. Those generals, those military people in Egypt, have to turn on the television people and see all those people in the square and say, we better start cutting some people some slack here or we could end up as, look at Gaddafi's son. What's going to happen to him? Well, he'll be tried. I think the problem is that the military in Egypt sees that they have to do something. They do. And they have taken some steps. Okay. But they are also totally tone deaf, so that the steps they take are the wrong steps. They have named the prime, replaced the prime minister because he was very unpopular. And they go and choose somebody who had been prime minister under Mubarak, which seems to me almost unconscionable. Mm. Why they chose that person? I think they have a very narrow comfort zone. They only trust certain people. Maybe it's and human uh, nature, huh? Maybe it's human nature. We go into philosophy here, uh, really <laughs> not particularly well qualified to discuss this. We'll take a little uh, break here. Uh, our guest is Dr. Marina Ottaway, and she is a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a wonderful, wonderful organization. And Dr. Ottaway is experienced in all this uh, part of the world. Uh, and uh, let's take a little break, come back on the other side, and talk about how the United States has walked the tightrope in all of this. Take a little break. This is America. This is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. The Singapore Tourism Board, 
there's something for everyone. Singapore Airlines, a great way to fly. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust. The Arab League got involved. Syria yes. sanctions, huh? Yes. And this is extraordinary. And I think it's a story that has not been well understood in oh, this country. Please. Because what we get a lot of saying, well, what is the Arab League going to do in the end? You know, sanctions are not going to work. And then what? That's certainly a valid question. But the real story here is that the Arab League, that is a bunch of Arab leaders who have always defended each other in the past, mm -hmm. has come out strongly condemning one of them, mm -hmm. one of their own. And what indicates to me is they realize that they get it, that they understand that, that the public mood is such that they cannot be seen to condone the excesses of the Assad regime, and they have to do something. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, it's the first time it has ever happened. So they have suspended them from membership? They have suspended Syria from membership, and they have imposed the sanctions. Mm -hmm. And those sanctions are pretty strict. I mean, they, they, uh, they are not only the sanctions against members of the regimes, but also sanctions against any dealing with, uh, with the uh, central bank of the of Syria, which means essentially all commercial ties are going to be cut and, and so on. Travel has and, tra reduced, uh, and travel has been reduced for diplomats and such? Absolutely. So that it's, they, they go pretty far. Now, do sanctions ever work? I think the lesson of history is that sanctions have limited effect. But, but when you have an organization of 22 countries, the Arab League, coming out so, uh, so dramatically, and forcefully against one of their own. That's a big step. It's a big step. The condemnation is quite clear. The mm. symbolism of the gesture mm. is very important. Now, Iraq will not respect the sanctions. Lebanon will not respect the sanctions. And of course, Iran, which is not even part of the Arab League, will mm -hmm. not respect the sanctions, which means that, uh, that uh, uh, Syria will trade indirectly through those countries and so on. So the impact of the sanction is going to be decreased. The symbolism, the condemnation is not going mm. to be decreased. Uh, let's talk about the United States and how the Obama administration has handled this walking on a tightrope. In Egypt, uh, a close relationship of many, many years, and they look at Egypt's relationship with uh, Israel, that's on the table. Uh, support of the military over all these years. Ye Yemen, we're worried about al-Qaeda in Yemen. The United States is involved in uh, negotiating the president stepping down and, not liked by a lot of people, granting him immunity from prosecution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, Bahrain, this report is now out talking about all the torture and horrors there. Uh, Saudi Arabia supported Bahrain, yes. sent troops in there. The United States is, uh, I mean, when do, you, when do you do things because it's right? When do you do things because it's politic? When do you think, do things when it's in the nature of our own national interests? Well, the United States has had, a, the Obama administration, I should say, had a lot of trouble deciding among those different uh, uh, requirements, in a sense. They resisted uh, abandoning Mubarak, then they finally abandoned him. They are finding themselves in the same situation in Egypt, because they have to decide whether to continue backing the military. That was their fallback. The U.S. wanted change in Egypt. It does not want to see a revolution in Egypt. The United States does not like revolutions for good reasons. So that essentially they felt very reassured about having the military still holding the reins of power after Mubarak was gone. Now they have to realize that they cannot continue supporting the military, and they have started backing, backing off a little from the military. But it's a very uncertain policy mm -hmm. still, because in the end, 
it's also likely that the result of these elections will see the Muslim Brotherhood doing very well. Mm -hmm. So that the United States is very ambivalent about what it won't really to see happening in Egypt. Uh, Bahrain is a major dilemma for the United States. We got a base there. We have a base there, and we cannot, and we don't want to offend the Saudi Arabia. That, after all, uh, is not only the biggest country in the Gulf. So that if it ever comes to a war with Iran, it's crucial to U.S. interest. But also, it's, uh, you know, it's a bigger supplier of oil, if not uh, directly to the United States, because we don't import much oil from uh, Saudi Arabia directly, but to all the market, the, to the oil market in general. So. It does not want to, to lose its base. It does not want to, to offend Saudi Arabia any more than it has already offended it. But at the same time, the condemnation of uh, of the Bahraini regime, by the, or the, the, or the monarchy, by the Basuni report, this international uh, commission, is pretty strong. Now, the Bahraini government is trying to it's claiming that it's taking all the steps that it was required to take, so that it's going to make the, the situation of the United States a little easier. However, it's clear that the uh, opposition in Bahrain is not buying it. Mm -hmm. So the United States will still be facing a very different, sit difficult situation. And the biggest the problem of all, of course, is Syria. Because Syria, probably the regime will not fall just because of sanctions. So at some point in the future, the decision of whether to participate, not to lead, because that's not going to happen, but to participate in a military intervention, is going to loom. Could, could, could it be kind of like a NATO thing, like it was in Libya, and the United States kind of being in the background? Might that happen? I'm sure that the United States will not lead an intervention. I'm not sure it's going to be NATO first. I think it's much more likely to be countries of the region mm -hmm. intervening. Ah. Uh, Turkey, certainly, yeah, but not necessarily as a member of NATO. It ah. may be Turkey as Turkey. I have not heard much a discussion of an intervention, but in Turkey, both the prime minister and the foreign minister have said, you know, this is the first step, and in the end, the, the, in the intervention cannot be uh, excluded. Look at all this, uh, that's going on in that part of the world. Why should Americans care, number one? And number two, what's at stake for America in all of this? Well, uh, we are a superpower. And as long as we want to continue being a superpower, we cannot say this does not, this does not matter to us. Mm. Secondly, there are very direct economic interests. That is the oil issue. It mm. is important to the United States that the area that nothing happens to make it impossible for the oil exports to continue. Uh, third, and probably in the minds of US policymakers, of many U.S. policymakers, that actually comes first, is our commitment to protect uh, to protect Israel, which is becoming more and more difficult to protect because it's also pursuing policies that are bound to cause strife with its uh, with its neighbors. So it's very difficult for the U.S. to pull back from this situation. Mm. Um, there are areas of progress in this area, in this uh, part of the world. Uh, we mentioned Morocco, Tunisia, uh, some elections there, and that's where it all started, in a way, huh? Yeah. Way back when? Yes. Uh, Tunisia, I think, it's, to me, it's even more encouraging than Morocco. Uh, Tunisia had a real election. Uh, I think they seem to be, uh, because in Nahda, which is the Islamist party, won the plurality but not a majority of the vote, they are being forced to, uh, to uh, uh, form a coalition government that contains both secular and yeah, Islamist yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, elements, and that is the best thing that could have happened to the country, because it has to overcome this, uh, 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 you know, divide that exists between secularist and, uh, and Islamist. So this is a good step. Morocco, it's a bit different in the sense that in Morocco, most of the power is still in the hands of the king. Mm -hmm. The king managed to calm down protest by uh, 
uh, sort of giving the country a new constitution, but it's still the king giving. Mm -hmm. It's still not a really he the democracy. Yes, yes. He makes the decisions. Yep. Now, in Islamist parties will form the government, again, in a coalition. Uh, that's probably not a bad thing in terms of trying to bring some new blood in the mixture. On the other hand, it will not have the power to go too far, so I don't think we have to worry about an Islamist revolution taking place there. But I think the showdown in Morocco may still have to come. You know, when people uh, talk about this, they, they worry so much about, is it going to be a secular government? Is it going to be an Islamic uh, government? Uh, does it make any difference uh, in, in the long run, or is the best of both possible worlds a little bit of both? Because that's the way those countries operate. Well, if you assume what is quite, if you accept what is quite clear now, that you cannot have democracy in this part, you cannot have free elections in this part of the world without Islamist parties winning a very important part of uh -huh. the vote, uh -huh. then you have, you say, the best thing that can happen is a coalition government yes, that yes, forces yes, yes, Islamist yes. and secular parties mm -hmm. to work together. Because we should not have any illusions that you, you can both have elections and keep the Islamists out of the political process. Let's uh, enlarge the canvas a little bit, uh, because the United States and Pakistan seem to be at uh, another crossroads, shall we say, because of this uh, airstrike that killed uh, 24 of the uh, Pakistani soldiers. Mm -hmm. And Lord knows what that's all about. Um, but Pakistan is crucial to Afghanistan. How's that all going to shake down? <laughs> A lot of people would like to have an answer to that question, and I really do not. I mean, Pakistan, the relation with Pakistan, it's one of the most difficult relations that we have. Because we don't want to have Pakistan as an enemy. But Pakistan, on the other hand, it's not a good ally either, because Pakistan has its own agenda. The United States look at Pakistan as part of a geopolitical game. Pakistan has its own agenda that has a lot to do with its boundaries and its, uh, uh, you know, not in the, the uh, global and, uh, uh, alignment, but more the boundaries, how it deal with the Taliban next door in Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. And therefore, the United States and Pakistan keep on working at cross-purposes. At the same time, the United States does not want to lose that, uh, that, that connection to Pakistan, because I think Pakistan could be very dangerous if it, were, if it had a real hostile relation with the United right, States. Right, if, if they get cut loose. Uh, Iraq is a mess. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, it's just uh, you referenced Iraq a, a little earlier in the conversation, and I just look at it, and then every time you pick up the newspaper, you, you know, there's another bombing and another 12 people have killed, or so on and so forth. Is that ever going to straighten out? Is that, well, have you got is, hope there? Do you have hope there? I think it's a very mixed a mixed picture, yes. Yes, there are still terrorist incidents, and certainly they are not on the level on, uh, you know, of the past, but certainly there are far too many incidents still. On the other hand, Iraq is muddling through, in a sense. It's not a democratic system, but it's a very pluralist system. Most of the groups have found the modus vivendi, the Shia and the Sunnis and the Kurds and so on. It's a very tense coexistence, but it's nevertheless a coexistence. Iran, what's going to happen there, and how's, how's that going to work out? Do well, you... certainly Iran is not giving in to the sanctions. The sanctions are not forcing Iran to desist from developing nuclear weapons, so that it's going to continue. Uh, there is, once again, growing pressure from Israel to saying let's, uh, it's easier to deal with Iran militarily now before they have nuclear weapons that it would be in the future. The Obama administration does not appear to have any intentions, and, I, and I'm glad of that, to go to war right now. When all these countries say it is absolutely uh, uh, non-negotiable, that Iran has a nuclear weapon. Is that position the right position, or will they at some point have a nuclear weapon? Well, 
I think the chances are pretty good that they will have a nuclear weapon. Uh, or at least will have the capacity to create that nuclear weapon. Uh, Iran has been fairly cautious. They, uh, uh, it seems to me that they are not rushing to actually have the weapon. They want to have the capacity to do so when they want. And, uh, and it's possible that it will continue remaining a very ambiguous situation. Uh, because it's in, in Iran's interest to maintain the ambiguity, because if it became absolutely clear that they, are, that they really are in the process, of, they are close to having that nuclear weapon, then is when you could see an intervention. Doctor, so good to be with you once again. Very good to see you. Thank you, you for our second education. Thank you. You're welcome. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, and online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. This Is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. Hunsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust.